Hello and back again to the meanwhile fifth part of programming with the Bitweek API and this time we want to look a little bit into how you better organize your code, how you monitor properties from Bitweek and how you do caching if you send MIDI out to your device. So what we did last time was look into how to get MIDI input and how to control some functions in Bitweek. For this we used the transport to start playback, stop playback and and so on. So this time we're gonna look at the other missing two pieces is monitoring Bitweek and also sending out MIDI data. So looking at our code from last time, I noticed that actually the keyboard and the control commands are sent on the same MIDI channel and they are in conflict. So what I did was change the MIDI channel of the Mox F to number two. The control of the transport is still running on one so we don't get a conflict. So what I needed to do is to change this back here to one. So one means MIDI channel two because zero is MIDI channel one. And we now don't get a conflict and the keyboard is sounding now still on that MIDI channel two. And we can also have the transport buttons without making MIDI note sounds. When you look at that code, you notice something it's getting already pretty complicated and longish. So what you should always do is organize your code and not much people know this, but actually JavaScript is a very powerful object oriented language. So you can really program nicely, but it's very easy to do it not. So that's the main problem with the language. It does not force you to do object oriented programming, but I will show you how you can do that. If you look at our code here, we already have several stuff in here. We have things from your hardware device, connecting to your hardware device, receiving information from your hardware device. It's always up to you how you structure that thing. You can now say, okay, I want to wrap the MIDI features. I want to wrap the hardware device and all these things. To keep it a bit simple, I only will now create a class who will encapsulate the whole hardware stuff. So the MIDI communication and the buttons and all these things in one class. And why not let's call that uh, the MoxF hardware class. We can simply create a new file and to create a new class, you'd simply write a function because uh, JavaScript is all about functions. And if you want to have a method in that function, you do it like this. This is now, let's also save that here to our moxf hardware to add methods to it you use that prototype feature and here you simply use the class name and you can go on like this and create further methods to add to that new class and the name and what we do here is for something later on so just leave it like this for example we can move out all the const things we want to have that there as well and let's encapsulate the media input port and the media output port so it looks like this we might have three parameters we want to have our output port the input port and the callback function for the MIDI input and what we do is we store that thing in our class so we create now a new property it's called port out and the property port in in which we simply store our input and output port so it means in the other methods we can access these variables and we don't have to deal with global variables which might clash with more code we add. And another thing to do is what we did before is to first set our MIDI callback function, which we got from the input. We need to set our callback function and we need to create our node input. And we can also just move over the example code of the translation, which we will not use, but we can keep that anyway for your reference if you want to do some kind of translation in there. We need to clean up as well our main source code. Let's have a new variable, which we call the hardware. And we need to create that variable here. So let's say we put that here. So hardware gets new MoxF hardware. This is a new class we created and the created output port goes in the input port and our callback function for MIDI. So we can clean up that stuff here quite a bit. Yeah, so this makes it already much more readable because you see in our init code, there is simply created our Mox hardware. So this looks pretty understandable and that's it. So let's see if this still works. No, it crashed. 
Ah, yeah, and the Mox hardware is not referenced. I forgot about that. So what we need to do is we need to tell our main script that there actually is this new code. So we need to use the load command. So the load command is specific to the Bitwig implementation of this JavaScript extension. And in there, you can simply give the name of your file you want to include. And if you write it like this, it has to be in the same folder as you have your main script. So you see, this is our main script in here. I also put the MoxF hardware script. You can also use subfolders. For example, if I would have a subfolder there called MIDI, I would need to write something like uh, this MIDI. And always use a forward slash in here, then it will work on all three platforms, Windows, Mac and Linux. So it runs again nicely and we can see if it's still working play stop and our keyboard is working as well so everything's still in place always when you wrote a bit code or even better before you start writing any code think about how you organize your code because then extending it is much easier in the future than having a long file with lots of stuff in it and if you look in that again after one year you have no idea what you did there Next thing to look into is how we can monitor value changes in Bitwig, for example, moving faders, starting the transport, because we want to show that on our device that the state has changed. Sadly, I could not turn on the LEDs, which is on the play and the record button, but nevertheless, I will show you how to do that. So how do you monitor values in Bitwig? There are two ways to do that. First, are the observers, which are there since version one of the Bitwig API, and we with Bitwig 2, something like Mark Interested was added. And whichever way you do it, you always need to think about that all the observers and your interest needs to be created or marked in the init function as well. Why is it the case? Because Bitwig is real time and it wants to be efficient as possible because the most important thing for such a door is the stable playback without any dropouts or cracks. This means Bitwig wants to know in advance which values you are interested in so it can optimize for telling you about them and not sending its whole state and everything to you all the time. And this is done via properties. For example, if we look at the transport again, which we triggered last time, there is one property called is playing. This property tells you about the playing state. So if the user does not start the playback on your device, but instead clicked on the play button or press the space bar, this property will change and you can get notified and so can turn on an LED on your device. So as I said, there are two ways to do it. The first one is to add an observer. Here we have our transport created and in it we have to add this function. So we access our property. So the property is the displaying property and we can add a value observer. And the value observer always needs as a callback a function with one parameter and the parameter will be the changed state of the property you are monitoring. So it depends on what you are monitoring, uh, what is the type of this value with the playing state it's always a boolean value so you get true or false so that's what we're using here so we're checking the value is it true then we say okay it's playing if it's stopped we say stopped so let's simply try that out if we look here at the console again it's restarted and if i start the playback you will see it will print out playing and if i stop it again it will say stopped that's the first way to do it. That's nice if you want to have some trigger action which could trigger it. But if you want to have the state for sending out to your device, uh, it might better to have a getter function instead. So you don't have to cache or store the changed value in your code. And to do this, you need to use the get function. The get function is pretty simple. You can do it like this. So again, use the property and then you can call a getter and you will also get back the state. But if you will do so, let's remove that one here for a second and you restart it, you will get a straight crash because you have to tell Bitwig in advance and call this mark interested function. If we are back here again, we calling here on the playing state. Now the mark interested.
then you will see it will run nicely. Another way is if you have a callback anyway, so if you register a callback, you also don't have to call mark interested because then also Bitwig knows that you're interested in that value and can also use the getter. How do we want to use that? Uh, we want to update now the LED state of our play button and we will do that in flush. So in flush we can now call our getter. Let's go with the getter. Let's lose that one because it's working now because we have here the mark interested called. In our flush function we get now this playing state and I prepared already this method which calls update LED and it gets as a parameter the play button and the playing state. So we now need to implement this function and this function will now also show you how to do a MIDI communication to your device. This will be simply sending out here the given note and uh, if it's on then we send here 127 or we send a zero by the way have a mox ever tried it will not work because it seems not to be possible to turn this led on in any way but with other devices you can do that pretty nicely and this is just to show you how to do it so the output port has a send midi function where you can send the same values as we learned in previous tutorials for the input so this sends a node command on midi channel one and the node is a node we get and we send a velocity of 127 if it's on and a zero if it's off the problem with that is now it's sent all the time if a state changes somewhere if we receive midi so all the time when flush is called this will be sent out this might overflow some devices which are not that fast with their processing so it's always a good idea to cache these things which means we only send an update if the value has really changed. How do we do that? We assume that here all the LEDs are triggered by MIDI nodes so we can have the maximum of 128 MIDI nodes. So what we will do is simply create an array in our MOXF hardware and we'll put that here and say we have an LED cache and this LED cache is an array with 128 entries and we initialize them with minus one. And now we have some more interesting code here. If it's on again Again, we have this value 127 or 0 and then we will check our cache and we have the cache at the given node and if it's different only if it's different than the value we get then we will store the new value in our cache the on or off state then we will send out this new value and this is just for your better understanding we will print out to the command line that we actually did the update or if it's already in the cache and the state is current we will do nothing let's check if that is working so now the restart happened and you see it sent update to zero because it's there is no playback if we now start the playback, you will see it sent out 127. But if I do anything else, an update, for example, let's move with volume, you see there is no update because we are caching nicely. And if we stop again, we will have it back to zero. So you learned in this tutorial how to monitor the state of Bitwig and how to send out MIDI. That's basically all the tools you need to write your own extensions and scripts for Bitwig. But nevertheless, there will be much more to learn. So until then, write your own stuff and write some funky code.